Hello, my name is John Reynolds. Welcome to Extraordinary Life Stories. On this episode, I'm talking with Danielle Nichols. Danielle shot to fame as the face of ITV's children television channel, CITV. She's had a multifaceted career in TV and radio, and currently she's the co-host of Saturday Night Talk Away Show on Talk TV. In 2012, Danielle and her husband, Dean Holden, suffered the traumatic sudden death of their beautiful 17-month-old daughter, Cece. Her candid sharing of the trauma and grief that she and Dean have been through and endured aims to provide comfort and hope to others facing similar struggles. I'm really looking forward to talking with Danielle, so let's get into it. Danielle, thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm a little bit nervous, but we'll be fine. You've got nothing to be nervous <laughs> about. Tell me, who is Danielle Nichols? I've been thinking about this because I know that's how you start. I honestly am just a little girl from Salford who got shot to stardom overnight, it felt like. Got to work with her best friend, Stephen Mulhern, be on the TV, the dream job. And then had the crap kicked out of her by life, I think. And yeah, you're looking beautiful right now, radiant, present. Oh, so fair play to you. Take me back to a young Danielle. What did you, what and who influenced your kind of career decision making? We came from like nothing. Mm. And I've been asked this and I, I was like, I wonder why I did want it. And I know, and I traced it back to when I was a, a kid, I did a nativity. And for the first time ever, I was given a part, like not a just a part, not yeah, a rock not or just a holding a tambourine or whatever, yeah. And they asked me to sing. It was a t just one verse of a of a carol song, uh, on my own. And my my uncle had a camcorder when no one had camcorders, right? <laughs> so because I'd been given this part, he offered to. Film it now. That was before you. It was filmed. You you turned up. You watched it. It was gone. But he said he would film it and allow people to have copies of it. So the whole school was like dead excited. Wait, it's going to be filmed on an actual camera because he was a bit nerdy. He was a techie guy, um, and of course he filmed it. And I sang, "Oh me a shepherd," and of course it was. I was all right. I was a great. I was no Celine Dion, but I could sing. And I remember just the audience silent and then my, my mum crying in a, in a happy way. And then the big fuss that came afterwards because everyone had it on video. And I can, I can only pinpoint that that was like the bug that bit me because I was quite a shy kid. I was very well behaved. I was the eldest kid. I was always the goody two shoes. But this was a bit like, oh, this was a bit nice feeling like the centre of attention. Then I went on to dance and I've always, I still dance now. I love, I do yoga, I love to move my body. I think it's um, therapy wise, one of the best things you can do for your mental health anyway. So I've always been into that and went on to dancing and started to do really well in that field. And again, you know, it was granddad, show us your medals. Have you won some medals? I'll buy your next pair of ballet shoes. And so again, that it was, that was it then. It just snowballed from there, I was like, I want to, I like this. So actually, I was quite a bright kid. Yeah. So my teachers wanted me to do well. They wanted me to go on to uni. Like a lot of my friends have gone on to, like one of my friends was a buyer for Topshop. Like she's now oh, so ridiculously talented. But so I was quite bright. I was in the bright class, but I was like, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to be on telly. That's what I'm going to do. I like that. So you had the option to go academic. But oh God, yeah. My teachers were furious. Oh, really? Furious. My maths teacher dragged my mum in and he said, she's not going on to college. I didn't get A-levels or anything. She's not going on to college. And, and my mum went, no. He's like, well, she's taking the top maths um, papers. And my mum was like, she, but she doesn't like it. Do you know what I love though? You followed your passion. Yeah. So many people don't. Well, and my so mum people... said, get your GCSEs and I'll let you go to dance college. That's quite that's standard, right? Happened. But at least you weren't made to do A-levels or university, which no. a lot of parents could insist on because that's what they did and so on. And then you might have lost your passion. Absolutely. Um, or the moment might have might have gone and life gets serious. So yeah. I, I, I love that. And, and have you always been this kind of bubbly and it, it feels like you're kind of full of energy? Have you always had that as well? Because that feels like it needs to go hand in hand with what you do, because you need a lot of confidence to, to you won a competition of a you thousand be, people to yeah. become CITV front person. Have you always had that? Yeah, I've always been too much. 
<laughs> my mum used to say, you're too much. And people who knew me were too much. In fact, I, this is a weird thing. I don't think I've ever said this before. Someone said to me, what's it like being famous? And I said, it's the only time I feel normal. Because I always felt like I was too much. I dressed too different. I shouted too loud. I was way too excited for any situation. I had way too much energy. My dance teacher, always oh, your voice I can hear, Danielle Nichols, she'd say. So like, I was always too much. But, you but know, when you're famous, you're allowed to be too much. I get that. And you can be extreme. You yeah. can wear what you want and, and yeah. so on. I, I was in Global the other day and Jonathan Ross walked past and I, rec I recognised him because I looked to what he was wearing first. And, and you're looked like, up and saw him. Yeah. It was nuts, but it was, yeah. it, it was great and it suited him. Yeah. That's interesting because if you, if you look at the fact that I'm with you now and you're just excited, you're excited to be here. We're, this is this is a conversation that you're present in and want to be. That's just your way. It is for someone to then almost put you down. So actually, you, you sort of found your niche. And did you enjoy the TV kind of career from the moment you got in? Because there was probably no prep for fame. In today's world, there'd be someone catch, catching you to check you're okay and dealing There's with none press of that. and so on. You had to deal with all that on your own, Oof. right? And it, I had a bad time of that at one point. So obviously, so Stephen and I were living together. So me and Stephen were, were roomies. We did it all together. And we were catching the bus into Birmingham. And we'd been on TV about four months before we could not get on the bus. And it was Stephen said to me, it's all right, Dan, they'll have to get us a car now. <laughs> <laughs> we were yeah. like, yeah, they'll have to get us a car. Because yeah. we couldn't, the bus driver chucked us off at one point. He said, you're causing too much disruption. You'll have to get off the bus. Ask him, deadly serious. So they didn't. When you two together, just, oh, we're I mean, crazy. on TV, that's one thing, but in, in normal life, that must have been. I'd, I'd love to be in a fly on the wall. He was my best. <laughs> he still is my best friend. Oh. He's, a, he's a legend. If you can get hold of him on the phone, if he'll actually reply back to he you. He does seem like the busiest, <laughs> busiest guy ever, doesn't he? He's, he's, he's everywhere in a good way. Yeah. Mr. TV. So, yeah, so we did all that together. But and then, like you say about the press, it was none of that. Um, and we, we, it was. It sounds ridiculous, but we were just so oblivious to it. But we were on telly six days a week. So, like, I remember my sister saying, we were going organising to go to the local shopping centre, and she said, I'm not going with you, it's ridiculous. And I was like, what? And she said, we can't even get round the shops. It's just stupid. Because it was literally like, photo, photo, photo. What would be normal autograph. for some people, whatever normal is, is just walking along, that you'd be creating the yeah. adventures. And, little... and especially if Stephen and I are together. And funnily enough, when we had lunch of few months back and we got it again he said Danielle and Steve which is funny because he's so famous isn't it but it was still like it's Danielle because we were like together we were yeah. like it was nuts but yeah it, the the press I avoided and Stephen's a very private person so he very much he never flirted with the press and still doesn't now but we managed to avoid that until I decided to have a famous boyfriend which yeah that was fun and I feel like I was so naive and stupid and I didn't realise what the situation was. I genuinely did not know who he was when we met. And he said, I'm a footballer and I've got a push. I went, yeah, whatever, like chat up line, whatever. No, and he's like, do you not know who I am? I was like, honest to God, we were at some Westlife. Uh, weirdly, Westlife were opening Radio City in Birmingham, so we were at like an opening thing. So I, I knew there was a good chance he was important. Anyway, I fell madly in love with him, head over heels, and, uh, he, and he made a bit of a fool of me. Uh, do you know what? I was naive, I was stupid, but then when you're coming out of work and this pap's there, and then the way you live, it's really frightening. And it was, there was other pressures as well, which I won't talk about, but from his side. And a good friend of mine who worked at CITV, who's still my friend now, called Annette, really protected me and really looked after me. At least you had someone. I had someone. Was... She was she was really clever and she was very smart and she knew I was struggling because I just felt so stupid. I was like, everyone must think I'm this big home wrecker and I'm this, it was just awful. And th so that was my first taste. And I, I understand why people don't flirt with the press in that way. And I've always shied away in the same way. You know, you won't see me doing something for the papers. Do you know what I mean? If it, if it gets in the papers, great. But there's that little bit of me that's like, oh, because if that turns bad, it's not very nice. No, I get that. And I think that's having purpose and, and a passion for what you're doing behind it. Yeah. 
Uh, and I know, and it's so clear, you've got a passion and purpose to, to, and you belong on the TV, right? And it's just, it's just you exude it. Uh, and I that big personality, it. but it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a natural part of you. One of the things that you know, I, was, I was always going to talk to you about is that, that that sort of natural happiness, if you like, and energy, you've taken an absolute smashing in your life from a trauma point of view. And I know it's, it's going to be hard to talk about, but at 17 months old, Sissy, your little daughter, died so suddenly, unexpectedly, whilst on a holiday that should be an incredible memory and you know, making great memories. Talk to me about that and talk to me about the, the, the grief that you continually go through and how you still sit here now, being inspiring, being great company, being Danielle. Tell me about that. Well, I wasn't Danielle for a very long time. I always say I was like a ghost in my own life, which I now realise is a side effect of PTSD. Almost like a numbing. Yeah. So I was numb to everything. Because on the day, I remember just feeling like I wasn't in my own body when it was all happening. I felt like I was out of my own body. It must be a protection mechanism or something. You must remove just, yourself, yeah. Yeah, you just, like, this isn't really happening. This isn't really real. It, numb is a better emotion than doing something stupid. So I understand why you get that emotion. But it's why I took so long out because I never felt like I knew I'd have to be able to talk about it. I couldn't. I knew I'd have to be able to be upbeat and be myself to be able to be, because I am a bubbly, that, that is who I am. But for a long time, that Danielle was, she was dead. Like, and, and you know, do you know what? I see like, and I know my husband does the same thing. I feel sorry for that Danielle when I look at me before that happened. I, th I just feel like sorry for her. I just, oh, I think that poor girl, like what you're going to have to go through. You look at her and so it becomes two different people, which is just, I know it's weird, but it is two different people. Like she was this, as long as, long as you're a good mom, as long as you work hard, as long as you look after your family, as long as you make good choices, everything will be okay. Not when, when you lose a kid, you realise in fact, if anything, I remember just thinking, well, what, is there any point in making any decisions? Because whatever's going to happen to you is going to happen to you. So there's that feeling of thinking, I'll just back away from any decision because whatever's going to happen is going to happen. So for like a long time, I couldn't take the kids, like if they were poorly, I couldn't take them to A&E &E or any of that. So basically, the... Um, We'd gone, we'd gone, it was a perfect storm, which it always is in these scenarios. We'd had a delayed flight. She'd been under the weather. We'd got on this delayed flight. It was Tenerife, well, Lanzarote, so it was miles away. So we'd had this massively long flight. She'd missed the naps, all the usual things. She was super, super sleepy. But I thought it was because we were traveling. I get that. So I, yeah. you, don't think, you don't think, oh, there's something really wrong. I was just like, well, clearly she's going to be knackered. We've been traveling all day. The flight's been delayed. It's been a bloody nightmare. So we get to resort and we're in a villa because we had, we had like a cluster of children between us. Between, so me and, me and my husband are, ma are married to brothers and sisters are married to brothers and sisters, just to be weird. So my sister's married to Dean's brother. I know we're just weird like that. That's how we do it in Salford. Um, so we, we always holiday together. She was running around the pool when we first arrived. And then she just kind of, I remember her, she was watching Peppa Pig on the sofa and she started to fall asleep. And, uh, and she was, that's another thing. I remember she went to put her foot in the pool and it was cold, but she seemed to like shiver like as if it was freezing. And I thought, that's a bit weird. But again, you don't for any one minute think, anyway, we put her to bed. Another thing, the kids' bedroom, because we're in a villa, was over the other side of the living room. So the kids' bedroom's over here. We're over this side. We, she was kind of at that age where you don't need a baby monitor. But you obviously, I think we got up twice in the night. So and I, another thing you do as a couple, I got up, saw to her, changed the nappy. And then she cried again. And I did that thing where you go, your turn. <laughs> your turn. Yeah. She's crying again. Been there. Yeah. So we... Dean got up to her that time and he'd come in and said, I've given her some medicine. I don't think she's 
doing so good and you you're asleep it's just awful to think how the event snowballed but by the time we got up with her at eight in the morning she was making a strange noise so she was like going mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and we knew she weren't right and we grabbed a booklet from the villa that we're in and it said do not call an ambulance because apparently there's two ambulances on the island so they say get in a taxi because it takes too long get in a taxi go to the clinic they'll see you at the clinic now in the taxi she took a big drink of water you Look, to this day, my brother-in-law says he thought I was being dramatic. To this day. That's how Ill she, Ill she appeared. He said, I thought, is Danielle being dramatic? We got her at the clinic and I, s I stood in the line. I held her in my arms and I stood in the line. Like, what an idiot. Like, what an idiot. I stood in a line of people with my sick baby, like... And then Dean just said, swear word, sod this. And he goes to the front of the queue and he said, my kid isn't very well. Of course, the nurse came over and she went, and that's another thing, like, we didn't just have trauma. We had to experience trauma in another country. Mm. So then everyone's going, ah, blah, 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 in Spanish. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh my God. Because they took one look at her and then everyone started shouting and they dragged her in this room. And I'm glad I saw it because if you hadn't seen it, I, I meet a lot of parents who've lost children because of the groups we go to and everything. And they, they're very angry because they say, this is their fault, this is their fault, this could have been. And I get it. It's a blame. blame yeah, thing. a blame. The, it, you very much want someone to blame, but they tried their best to save a life. And I saw things that you shouldn't really see as a parent. You would have been taken out of the room, but everybody was panicking. And they were doing this, they stabbed these huge needles into their bones. Um, you think, what are they doing to my kid? Like, it looks like they're beating him up. Do you know what I mean? But I'm glad I saw it because I saw them fight for her life. You never doubt how much they tried to no. help. Yeah. So I know that they did their best. So those but the trouble is that that does never leaves you that that picture never leaves you i can tell you the whole day till she died every second and every minute but you asked me to tell you the next month and i can't i don't know what happened i can't remember I, apparently i didn't eat anything for two weeks i can't remember anything i can't re i lived off tea with sugar in apparently and my mum was just like oh my god what are we gonna do about her but i don't remember any of that but i'll tell you every detail so obviously, they tried to save her life. And then they said, we're taking her in the ambulance. And I, I said, I'm coming with you. And they, they, they said, no, we're already, they, were, they broke the law and overloaded the back of the ambulance with too many staff. It was illegal what they did. They said, we're already breaking the law because there's too many of us in the back of this ambulance. But there's something about, you're not allowed to die in an ambulance in Spain. It's, it's a big problem. It, I now realize they were just keeping her alive, but I thought there was a chance. So they put her in the back of this ambulance and you, by this point, I'm just shaking. And I, that's when I felt like I left my body then. So they put us in a taxi behind the ambulance and the ambulance pulled over at a service station. And you know what I'm thinking? Are they getting petrol? Like, are they getting petrol with my kid in the back? They weren't, she was dying. So they were stopping to, to bring her back to life. So then again, we set off again. And we beat the ambulance because they stopped at this service station. We beat the ambulance to the hospital. And we got there and this lady stood there. And you can always tell by how they're dressed at, at the hospitals, how important someone is, can't you? Because if they're not in the whites, they're probably really, really important, aren't they? And she said, um, I'll never forget it. And she just said, it's very grave. Strange word, isn't it? But it's because it's, we're abroad. And she said, um, I have to tell you, it's very grave. I said, oh, okay. And she said, you'll need to come with me in this room. Now, as she did that, the ambulance pulled up and she, they wheeled her out. No one should ever see that. No. Because I knew she died. She was technically still alive, but I could see. I was like, 
Oh, and then every your your world just falls to like I looked at Dean and I could see that he didn't see what I saw. I know he didn't. I know he was like they're still trying to save a life. Still hope. Yeah. So she took us in this room, and again, too short a time, five minutes, and she's back in the room. You're like, oh, God. And she just said, I'm really so And Dean went, and this, and it sounds daft, like when you leave it, Dean went, no! Like, as in, don't you dare tell us that. Don't you dare tell us. Didn't want to hear it. Yeah. I just sunk to the ground. And then Dean started smashing the place up. And I, I remember being really embarrassed. And I'm thinking, stop it, we're in a foreign country. Do you, I mean, as if he'd have got in any trouble. But he started to like throw the, he threw a chair across. And then he like stormed over to this table. And he, he says he don't remember any of this, but he like banged on this table. And, and I'm just thinking, they're going to put us in jail. They're going to put us in jail. I don't know, I, I don't know why. Maybe it's because at that moment you removed yourself. I think I mean, so. Just listening to you there, and then I'm, you know, just it's just so emotional listening to you. But part of you died at that moment, and you say you don't remember the next month. And Dean's reaction, you know, you, 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 a coping mechanism isn't in place for that, right? We're not prepared for that. I, I you know, I'm a, I'm a father myself, and just listening to you, your way of dealing with it was was removing yourself from it and not even remembering half of what was going yeah. on. Dean's was to just probably a very um, male yeah. reaction, which is, um, I can't control this, yeah. so I'm going to do something I can control. Yeah. I mean, just going from that to, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to skip lots out, but to coming to, to right now, where you two, you and Dean, are such a solid couple. You know, I'm, I'm talking to you now because of a message that Dean sent me, that just, put, you know, you two are such a unit, there's such a, a bond there. And it's quite a rare thing, actually. And, and, you know, just the fact that you've come through this, what, what have you done? How have you coped? You know, for, for, you know, there's, there's times that you can't remember. There's times that you weren't yourself at all. But you are now in the best possible way that you can be, and so is Dean. How have you done that? And what advice can you give to anyone that's clearly going to go through anything remotely close to what you've gone through? Well, firstly, we're not perfect. It's I love the fact that you've said that. Yeah. Because I bet but who is Danielle? I know. Who is? But but we choose to be married. It's a choice. And I think you don't need the trauma to get good advice in that regard. It is a choice to be married. You have to choose it every day. Because part of you wants to run away from it all, run away from everything associated with that pain. You blame each other. I was just going to say, you mentioned blame. And I, and I wondered whether that, in your instance, perhaps not, but in some other people's instance, if there's any blame apportion, that must be so heightened. And then, you know, can you even stay together? But, you know, just... So someone once said about blame, oh, no, we were at a support group, and this lady said, I just couldn't get over the fact, she's talking about her husband, he weren't there. We used to go to support groups together, but a lot of time it's just mums. I could never get over the fact that he would just never seemed, it never seemed to have hurt him the same. He, did, he, he didn't love her the same. She was talking about her own relationship with losing her own child. And it came round to me and I just very calmly said, no, he, he didn't love her as much as I did. I, I'm not angry at him. I'll just tell you now. There's no way. <laughs> I'm not. My, I carried her in my body. I knew her nine months longer than he did. Like, no way did he love her as much as I loved him. I'm not. I'm not mad at him for that. No one loved her as much as I loved her. No one. So I'm not. He doesn't. We don't need to. It doesn't need to be an argument about it. He always says because he was the last to go into her. He's always very much when we've done therapy or counselling that. It comes up with Dean, because Dean, because as a father, he says, "You promise you'll always protect this child from the minute they're born." Especially a daughter. And he said, "I didn't do that. I couldn't do that." And so, there's a what we found is 
rather than a blame game or rather than a attacking each other or becoming each other's enemy, it's, it's all right to mess up. You have to look at it like you would your own child. We all make mistakes. So we know we weren't to blame in that situation. Obviously, she died of meningitis. She had an underlying issue. She sepsis overtook her and then there was no going back. And once sepsis gets in, that's it. And once she was, uh, and it, before we got to that clinic, that's what had set in in that taxi ride. We, you know, that's what happens. But it's okay to say, and this is where I come from, I messed up and that's okay. And people say, you didn't, you didn't, there was nothing you could have done. No, that's not helping me. That's not getting me anywhere. What I need to do is look at what I could have done differently, but know that when I did what I did, it was coming from the best place with the best intentions and maybe, maybe I'm not perfect. And then what I had to do in therapy was forgive myself. And that's what I had to do. I had to, because I remember people, so I've, I've, I've done like support groups for breastfeeding. I do a lot of stuff with breastfeeding. I'm big into that. And, um, and I've done a lot of stuff with helping with postnatal depression and things like that. But I always think when people ask my advice, there's a little monster in me that goes, what do you know? Your kid died. There's a little monster that does that in the back of my head. And then I, just for a second, and then I think, no, no, I'm giving what I think is the best advice I can give. But that sits with you. I don't need anybody to, I don't think any parent needs anybody to give them an hard time. I think we give ourselves enough of a hard time. Well, you just said it, the voice in your head. Yeah. I mean, I can't relate to what you're saying. I, I can just only empathise and, and I know that I've got voices in my head that I'm like, really? Really? Yeah. What are you? Yeah. But so to have th those voices in your head is something you, at least and actually therapy, is that something you, you instantly went out and sought or was it offered to you? Because clearly that's something you brought up a few times that, that's helped you. Dean and I, a couple of days later, sat at, literally on a cliff edge in Lanzarote. And he always says now, you know I had older you, don't you? I said, I know you had older me. If we didn't have two children at home waiting for us, we would be sat having this conversation. To live with the pain and the physical pain of what you then have to wake up to every second that you go to sleep and you forget your awful life and then for that split second you wake up and you've, you've forgot for just a second that you've got a dead child and then you go, oh, there it is, there it is, there's my hand that I was dealt. And I think we were, there was no question, we were broken. We were absolutely, the two of us, broken. But you've only, no one's going to come and rescue you. And I think because we were both the eldest children, in, we, well, he's the second eldest, but eldest boy, but we were the older kids in the family. We'd always took the bull by the horns. We've always had to fight for ourselves. We've always had to... You know, it's been do it yourself or it don't get done. And I think we both knew we're going to have to fight for this. And as far as a marriage goes, I'm not, I cannot sit here and preach and say that I haven't made mistakes and that Dean hasn't made mistakes. Like, but ultimately, I couldn't imagine spending my life with someone who hadn't loved her and known her and so that as a woman has always pulled me back and it's I mean it's hard man it's hard to be married it's hard to be married for a long time it's certainly hard to bring your kids up and then kind of find yourself again once they're independent and don't need you anymore and it's also hard to to not women are, we're terrible at making ourselves the victims you know we put everyone first and we love doing it we put everyone first before ourselves and then we suddenly go what about me and it's like well you know we did it we we caused this problem and then we suddenly go no one cares about me and it's all about everyone else but we made it like that you know what i mean it's very difficult i see young mums and they just it's just all about the kids and you kind of just want to go to them just keep a little bit back for you but we don't and they won't and i didn't 
We no, give it all to our kids, don't but, we? But you've been through something that gives you perspective and maturity that in the nicest way makes you formidable, makes you resilient, you and, and Dean. But you also know that you've got that from something that, you know, to use that, that, that term, no, no pressure, no diamonds, you have, you have been stress tested. Oh God, yeah. I mean, it makes you one tough woman now. And what I love, and I, I, I want to talk about what you're doing now um, with Talk TV and the kind of revitalizing of your career, because you've gone in and you've probably, again, use that word formidable. Now you, you, you've got passion for what you do. You know what you're good at. You know what you want to do. And you seem to be loving it again because you come through a seriously tough period and it's always going to be there. But even meeting you here today and so on, you know, you're, you're on it. When did you feel ready to do that? And what are you now, what's the trajectory of where you want to go to? A second trauma. So remember, you, I don't know if you remember when we first met, we were talking about Jack and how the trauma happens 10 years after. It's interesting you say that, literally 10 years to the day. It was the COVID lockdowns. So it was 10 years after she died. We're in the COVID lockdowns. Dean's this big celeb down in Bristol, can't walk down the street because he's suddenly the manager of Bristol and I'm being asked, can you hold me bag and can you take a picture? Do you know what I mean? And then of course we go into COVID lockdown and it's awful. Four kids, I've got teenagers who won't get out of bed in the morning and who won't go to bed at night and who won't get off the computer games and who are crying because they can't go and play football with the mates. I've got little Liz, I've got a two-year-old who all he wants to do is distract his sister from doing any of her homework because she's my only girl and the only one who wants to do any schoolwork because it's fun. So she wants to do schoolwork, he's ripping her stuff off the table, he's fighting and I'm not allowed to get my mum to help, my sisters to help, my, my sister to help, my brother to help. I'm not allowed, we've got to do it all on our own. And I had, and I didn't realise I was starting the menopause, which I now realise, I completely disassociated from my life. I literally didn't want, I didn't want to be a wife. I didn't want to be a mum. I felt like I didn't love my kids anymore. I felt like I didn't love my husband anymore. He came home. I hadn't told him any of this because I was kind of like thinking, it'll go away, it'll go away, it'll be okay, it'll go away. And I remember like looking at the drawer with the paracetamol in, just thinking, I don't know if I can... I don't want to carry on. This is all. This is not a life. This is awful. And all you were allowed to do was go for a walk. He walked in the door from Bristol. And again, they were stopping him from coming back because of the bubble thing and all that rubbish. And he, he went for a walk. Uh, he, he said, you go for a walk. So I went for a walk. And about three hours later, he's like, where are you? I said, I'm, I'm not coming home. He was like, what? Now, remember, all we've been through and it's always been about talking. I've always told him if I felt a certain way. But because he had his big break, I'd kept it all bottled up. So ordinarily, I'd say to him, I'm feeling like neglected. I'm feeling like I'm doing all the kids on my own. I'm, we're we work in the respect that we're both very vocal. He, obviously, he thinks I'm a big emotional mess. But he'll listen to what I've got to say and it, it, accept some responsibility for it. He'll say like, well, you, there must be a reason you're feeling like that. What can I do to help? It's not about a blame game, is it? So, but I'd kept it all in because this was his big break. He was the going to, this was his first proper chance as a manager. And I, wanted, I didn't want all the pressure. So I kept it quiet, kept it quiet. And this is the problem. This is what we can't do. We cannot not talk. Like we have to, we have to talk about it. It doesn't go away by not talking about it pushed it down, pushed it down, pushed it down, went for this walk and just thought, maybe if I could like buy a tent. Because there were no hotels open just or anything. Just needed to escape. I just needed, yeah. And so anyway, luckily Dean said, right, we've got a therapist on Zoom. He was like straight away into panic mode. He's like, are you all right? And I just kind of went, no. <laughs> and he was like, right, okay. So I've uh, tomorrow we're speaking to a therapist on Zoom and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, and the therapist said to me, the words you're using are what I hear from people who've been put in jail. I was like, right. And she's like, I'm really concerned about you. And I'm really concerned that being in a lockdown is not very good for you. And as your therapist, I would advise you not to follow the rules. Those were her words. She said, from a health perspective, because this is making you really sick. 
She said, I have women who've got four kids, that's a problem in itself. I have women who've lost a kid, that's a problem in itself. I have women whose husband works away from home, that's a problem in itself. She said, oh, I have women who are trying to homeschool. She said, honest to God, no wonder. No wonder you're not well. At least you know you're not well. Right, okay, what, she's like, what can we do? So obviously, I'd, fortunately, money was able to pay us that. This is what makes me so angry because I come, we come from nothing. Like it should, you shouldn't need to have the money. You shouldn't need to be money. But yeah, I would buy a nice dress, so I'll pay for a therapist. Do you know what I mean? That's all, of all we've always been about it. We'll find it, we'll find it. We've not always had money. We've had a lot. That's another thing. We've been through a lot of hardship, a lot of financial struggles. It's kind of like, it, it, there's not much you could say to me that we haven't had a go at. Do you know what I mean? We, I have been in Asda and I've had to leave the shopping on the belt and say, oh, I'll have to check my card in the machine outside and then get in my car and drive home because I've been like, we can't afford to buy the food. <laughs> but from a perspective point of view, if you've been there and you've had that experience, then knowing that you've both grafted to be able to actually afford what you needed at that time, no one's resenting you for that. No, no. You, know, you don't need to justify that at all. And actually you could have been spending, as you said, your money on other things. At least you had that to spend yeah. on the things that have got you through. Well, and, that, and that's what, And she just said, what do you want? And I'll be honest with you, right? At this point, do you want to me? Do you want a boob job? Do you want a facelift? What do you want? You can have anything. I like the fact that he's a problem solver, right? <laughs> every, I mean, every time you've said you've had, you know, he's he is there, like which is, which actually explains his reaction when he couldn't solve something, which is so traumatic, yeah. and it must have been awful. But there is, I love, and I love the fact you said you both aren't perfect, but no. you're you, you've come in here today, and I love the fact that you've you've got through really tough times and the resilience is, is taking you to a point where it feels like this stage of your life and your career you know you're you're ready to flourish well that's what she said she said and, and dean said do you want a new car do you want a house you could have because at the for one point in our life we had a not a lot of money but we had a couple of quid where he could like say what do you want and i said i want me back I, and i know it's it's such a cliche i remember my mum left my dad at the same age mid-menopause, almost like textbook. It's embarrassing that us women are so predictable, but it's like, you you do suddenly think, like, who am I? Like, I couldn't, it sounds ridiculous, but she's like, what food do you like? And I said, well, whatever the kids are having, that's not an answer, is it? But you lost yourself at that point. Yeah. You're, you're a shell, you say you're a ghost, you know, so. Yeah. But... 10 years of just maintenance, and then a breakdown, basically of going, actually, everything is really has fell to crap. So, and I, I look and, and I, I asked myself, what do I want? And I thought, I want a, I want a bit of what I had of that, Danielle. Yeah. I want, and, on, and I didn't want a boob job. I know they're enormous, the kids did that. I didn't want that. I didn't want a facelift. I didn't want a new car. I just wanted some kind of work, my career. I wanted something for myself, where I could be Danielle, not wife of, mum of. And I know it's a cliche, and I don't care it's a cliche, because as women, we should be able to talk about it and say, actually, we've, we've totally lost ourselves in family here, and we need to find ourselves again. And we should be able to do that and not feel like, oh, here she is, it's hot sweats, you know what I mean? Like, we should be able to go, actually, this is a big deal, this. And it is a hormone imbalance, and I realise that now, and I didn't know that. So obviously, once I got on the HRT and my hormones got balanced, I love my children again because the happy hormone came back, and I thought, oh, I do quite like them; they're all right. But you got yourself educated to find out what it was to yes. then have the medication yes. to actually, you know, which which you could argue a lot of people are slow to do or don't yes. don't do. And in terms of how you manage uh, now with Dean Saudi Arabia. So the, the, the logistics of that, you've got your career resurrected. How are you managing that? Because there's some juggling going on there, surely. We don't do things by halves, do we? <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> do you know what as well? Like he's, he's, he, he, look, it's all the reasons I find him attractive. I'm not going to lie. He's very decisive. He makes a decision. He's got a pair of balls. It's all very sexy to me. I want him to be like that. But like literally he's like, right, we've had this opportunity and this is where I think we should, this is, this is what we're doing. And and it, it's not like he did it without my permission. He would never do that. But it was like, I'm, my job here is to support this family. And this is the best way of doing it. And it's going to give us 
an opportunity to give to our children what we were not able to have from our parents. It's not just that, we, we've got a mortgage to pay and we've got b bills to pay. You know, you've, you've got to earn a living and that is his job. It's not ideal, as in, I would love him to be a manager in this country. And I remember just going, you know, just get a manager's job in this country. <laughs> like I've always wanted to live down south. Anyway, but it is, I can see him grow and I trust in him and he follows his gut and he follows his instinct. He's following his passion as he well, is. right? And, and that's, you're following your passion. But as long as you can both do that, because you were so- human beings, John. And what happens, don't you find that in marriages, we become blurred into the shmish yeah. and we forget. Like, I don't have to be married to Dean Holden. I, and I sometimes, as women, we have to remind you men that we don't have to be there. You know what I mean? We don't have to be your it's wife. It's a choice. It is a choice, exactly. It's a choice that we make. But, and, it, and I think that in the same breath, he doesn't have to be married to me. I don't own him. He's doing, for, as far as I'm concerned, is he's supporting our family. He's doing what he thinks is the best for our family. That's it. That's enough, isn't it? And in his own way, he's you know, supporting you. Obviously, logistically, there must be times when he physically can't, but he's always checking in on you and you make that's it work. That's what he's like, though. No, I, I yeah. can tell. Yeah. And, that's and when he reached out to you. That's what he does. Yeah. He just doesn't, he just, if it's for his family, and that's why we call CC dying now our superpower. Because before then, we were very people pleasers. We were very, we wanted to keep people happy. And we wanted to be the goody two shoes and the achiever. And mummy and daddy say we're doing well. And we want all the things that you want, you know, that people strive for. When she died, you actually realise you're on your own. And you have to do what's best for you and the people you love. You cannot spend your life worrying about what other people say and what other people think. You have to live for yourself. Whereas, so... It's a bit like, I don't give a the, the I don't give a like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep trying to keep everybody else happy and spinning all these plates. I'm gonna do what I think is the best. And that is a superpower because when you've been a people pleaser all your life and you've been desperate, what, what, what must people think of me? Now I just think, well, do you know what? If they don't understand, they don't understand. They've not, you've not walked in my shoes, you don't understand. No, so. you're, you're, the way you've articulated that, I mean, through the most you know, tragic trauma, grief, there's a strength there that I can feel coming off you and when I'm with you and Dean together, it's, it's a resilience together. And you've, you've, you've got that bond that, you know, it lives in Cece's name, right? Yeah. But it's, it sort of connects you to send you forward. Yeah. You know, and you're not going to tolerate any, anything from anyone. And no. you're pursuing your passion, your dreams that I... I I could talk to you for so much longer, but we ran out of time. But thank you for being so honest um, and sharing so much with me now, which I think can only help other people in the context of the way that people can cope with anything that could be anything close to what you've gone through. So thank you, Danielle. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for talking to me. Oh, pleasure. <laughs>